afternoon, everyone. Uh, and as you've heard, I'm Pamela Gillies, Vice Chancellor of Glasgow Caledonian University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this, our first Captains of Industry Talk of 2022. And we have a great treat in store for you as I introduce Derek Proven, CEO of AGS Airports Limited, which covers, as you might have guessed, Aberdeen, Glasgow and Southampton airports, which before the pandemic carried between them 15 million passengers a year and directly supported 10,000 jobs. Now today, Derek will share his career journey with you, lessons learned along the way, and in the wake of COP26, we'll explore what businesses are and can be doing to be more sustainable and socially accountable. And I would imagine he will also provide insights into how our airports have coped through the last two very difficult years of the COVID pandemic. But first, a little bit more about Derek, who was born in our great city of Glasgow and graduated with a BSc in fire risk engineering and a master's degree in risk management from GCU. Then began his career with the Strathclyde Fire Service before his now over 20 year career in aviation, studying along the way for a master's in business administration with the prestigious Henley Business School, where he is now completing his PhD. Derek does not sleep. Derek rose to chief operating officer at Heathrow Airport before securing his new appointment as CEO of ASG in 2018. And whilst the last few years have been particularly tough for his sector, Derek is committed to innovation and considering how a decarbonised future for aviation can contribute to the fight against climate change. We are extremely grateful for all the support you give to our city, Derek, as a council member of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and to our own university. And we are thrilled to have you back with us this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Derek Proven to deliver this afternoon's talk. Thank you very much, Pamela, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you also to John and the alumni for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. So today I hope to give you a very potted history of my career, where I started, the thoughts that I had when I first went in, into my working career after school, some of the paths that I took during that time, and more importantly, some of the lessons that I've learned that I hope will be useful to yourself. Um, I have been uh, out of school and in, in the, the work arena for over 40 years, and so hopefully some of the information I can share with you today allows you to shortcut some of the mistakes that I've made and many people will make uh, throughout their career. So, as Pamela said, I am the Chief Exec of AGS Airports. We are the second largest airport group in the UK. Again, uh, thank you to Pamela. We serve around 15 million passengers in a non-pandemic uh, environment. The business itself is worth about £1.5 billion pounds, and we turn over in excess of £200 million pounds a year in normal circumstances. But of course, this isn't where I started. This isn't where I started. Uh, it's taken a long road uh, to get here, and a road that, quite honestly, I would never have expected to have taken in my career, which is where many of you will be uh, today, and I'll touch on that as we go through the talk. So I'll share some of my career history. I'll share some lessons learned, and hopefully some advice that I can give to you that you'll find uh, of value to you, maybe not even today, but maybe at some point in your future, you'll be able to look back and say, actually, I find myself in that position. What did I hear uh, when I was on that uh, Captains of Industry talk with GCU many years ago? So I left school age 16. I had very few qualifications. I had a few O-levels, which I think in your language today would be standard grades. And Quite honestly, I never really knew what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to leave school and move into the world of work. Uh, it took me a bit of time to decide uh, what I wanted to do. And actually, by the time I had made that decision, 
most of the big workplaces that took on apprenticeships uh, at that time had already taken apprenticeships on. So I was given an ultimatum by my father to say, you either have to go out and get a job or go back to school. I had decided that school wasn't for me. And so I effectively I went out into the city of Glasgow and walked up and down Sucky Hall Street, knocking on the doors of every shop. I came across, whether it was a newsagent's, whether it was a fashion shop, a bookshop, to see whether or not somebody would give me a job. Believe it or not, at the end of day one, I managed to secure a job. It was a thing called Youth Opportunities. To put that into perspective, I was getting paid uh, £18.60 a week. And actually, when I was at school, I used to do a paper run and I earned more money in my paper run than I did when I started at work. Uh, the job that I uh, took, which was one that I could never have imagined myself doing, but to be honest, the choice was to get a job or go back to school, and I had only a number of weeks to put myself in that position. I walked into a hairdressing salon and asked them for a job, and they gave me it and this youth opportunities. Three years later, I qualified as a hairdresser and started my own business. And after two years, realised that it wasn't for me. And I guess one of the learnings that you'll find throughout your career is Wherever you start, it's very unlikely that that's where you'll finish because you'll find that you, you mature your change and your, you know, you, your thoughts about the future change accordingly. And so I joined uh, Strathclyde Fire Brigade at uh, age 21. Um, I stayed with that Strathclyde Fire Brigade for 10 years, gained huge amounts of um, life experience working in the fire service and actually uh, gained a desire for public service. I could see the value that I brought back every day I turned up to my work and I loved working in the fire service. And then one day we were asked to come down to the airport to understand how we would support uh, the airport because in the airports we have our very own fire service, how we could support them. And when I came down and I realised that the fire station was right next to the runway and we could virtually look out and see the aircraft wingtips pass by you no know, more than 40 feet away. And I was hooked from that moment in time, went home that day and applied for the airport fire service. And I joined the airport fire service about two years later. Stayed in the airport fire service for about five years and thoroughly enjoyed it. It was like the VIP suite of uh, firefighting. But something else happened to me at that point because I had moved to a position where everybody was the same in the fire service. You came in at the same level. There were exams that you could do to move on to being an officer, but at that time I had no interest in that. But once I came to the airport, I started to realize that this is a city all of its own. There are so many opportunities that sit in the airport, so many jobs. It's not just fire service, it's engineering, it's customer service, it's retail. Uh, you look at security, you get airfield operations, you get air traffic control, the list is endless. Just in Glasgow Airport, we've got around 492 companies who operate to allow passengers to travel through the airport. But what I did learn is that there was a currency that was required if you were to progress within this corporate type organization. And that currency was formal qualifications something that I had never had before. And so I started to look at study for, at the time, institutional exams, which was engineering exams, fire engineering exams. And then age 32, maybe 33, uh, I came to GCU to do my BSc in fire risk engineering. And I have to say, at that point, I had thought I had made a massive transition because I thought I'd moved from a career in the fire service to a career as a fire engineer, designing um, fire installations, uh, sprinkler systems, alarm systems. And I enjoyed the, the, the uh, study so much that by creating the, uh, the qualification, suddenly I, become, I became noticed within the organisation and new opportunities came my way. And I left the fire service and moved over in Glasgow to run the airfield at that time. So this is a team of people who make sure that the airfield is safe, make sure that aircraft are 
parked where they should, that they get out in time, and they kind of police safety on the airfield. And then they moved into the world of uh, security. And I decided when I was probably about 37-ish, 38, to go in and do a master's in uh, risk management again at GCU. And once again, that created uh, more scope and more opportunities for me. And I progressed through senior management positions in Glasgow Airport, eventually ending up as a customer service director at the airport. And then life changed completely for me. With a couple of degrees under my belt and some senior management uh, experience, I went to Budapest. Uh, our business at that time had just bought Budapest Airport and I went over to Budapest as a chief operating officer in a completely different environment and an area that the safety and regulation of aviation just wasn't as mature as it was in the UK. And I stayed there for a period of time and then came back to Stansted Airport to run and operate that airport for a, a short period before going up to Aberdeen as the managing director. I spent about four years in Aberdeen and then I went down to Heathrow, the world's busiest airport, to run the airfield and air traffic control. And again, that was fantastic because it was very functional and you were effectively had aircraft landing and taking off every 45 seconds between six o'clock in the morning and half past 11 at night. Um, roughly about 220, 230,000 passengers a day and so complex, it was amazing how we managed to make it work every day before joining back here in AGS back in uh, 2014. So that's a kind of potted history, and then, as uh, Pamela said, I uh, then started my PhD, which was probably back uh, from 1921, it's probably back in 2017. But there's been so many challenges in the aviation industry over the last three or four years that once I got beyond the, my second master's, that you know I had to concentrate on running this business, uh, which I've done now for the last four years. So that's a kind of positive history of uh, my career to date. Very varied. Um, for many of you, you'll have a view in your head of what your future life careers will look like. The only thing I can say to you is be open-minded because it's likely to change. But I think there's some lessons learned through that career that I wanted to share with you. And the first one is, as I've already explained, and you guys are so far ahead of me uh, because you're already in that position, you understand the importance of uh, formal qualifications, education, and the rigor around academia. And that is that formal qualifications have a currency when you move into the working environment. And that currency comes from most of your hiring managers, your recruitment managers, your HR managers, or the line manager that you will come to work with in your first role have walked the same path as you. They recognize the commitments that you have to make to get those formal qualifications. And they expect that those are the commitments that you'll bring into the workplace. And they have, that has a real value, as opposed to someone without formal qualifications because they're a bit of a more unknown quantity. Now, what I'm not saying is that if you have a formal qualification, that makes you better than somebody that doesn't. But what I am saying to you is recognise that it has a currency and ensure that you explain the commitment when you go into your working environment of what you have to uh, deliver for your uh, degrees because that expectation travels forward and it creates a familiarisation with the organisation, particularly when you're sitting in those uh, difficult interviews when you move into that working environment. The second of you is, uh, the second lesson I, I would share with you, and hopefully you can see it in my career, I've missed out many, many roles in between. Uh, just because I was doing this talk, I went back to have a look at the number of jobs I've held since the age of 16, uh, which is over 40 years. And in total, I've had about 28 different roles. And let me tell you, I never ever knew that the next one was coming. So the first thing I would say is, it's great for you, have a, for you to have a career plan. It's great for you to know the degree that you're doing today and how that degree is going to help you move in 
to your future business life. Because without a plan, you'll never get anywhere. But also stay open-minded for opportunities as they start to arise. Because opportunities will arise. And there'll be opportunities when you come into organisations, particularly around development, where you might think, oh, I don't really think that's development for me. Take every opportunity, development opportunity that you have, because you never know when that development may have a value for a future opportunity that's going to come your way. So be open-minded about those opportunities and seek them. As long as you're looking for opportunities, opportunities tend to come your way. In life, you'll find that every now and again, there's, there's a pathway, there's two roads appear. And if you're open-minded, you'll pick the one that's right for you. If you're close-minded, you might not even see the opportunities as they arise. And then the last thing I would say from our lessons learned uh, during my career is, it's your career and you have to own it. You may be lucky and you may go into an organisation that's got very robust and rigorous talent and succession planning. But even that, it's not for other people to look to support you in your career. But in many cases, you'll get that support. I'm really keen in this business that we develop and create career paths for people moving forward because I've had that experience during my career. But it has to be your you have to own that career. You have to seek development. You have to push and understand uh, what's important in the organization. Every organization has areas that are important to them. Understand them and develop yourself in, in that direction. And that's where your progress comes uh, within any organization. But remember, it's you and it's your career. And maybe advice if I can, uh, to help you uh, around the ownership of your career and how you can best project yourself uh, moving forward is firstly, um, recognize the value that you see in others. So if you see uh, a value in, it might be a colleague, it might be a student, it might be a professor, it may be somebody that you work with today, it may be somebody in your family, but you find that you will become a patchwork quilt of key learnings and key experiences and key behaviours that you see from others. And I'm going to share with you some of them. Now, interestingly, you don't always see them at the time. Sometimes it can take years before you recognise that that was a value that you want to take forward in your career. So when I first joined the fire service, I had a, an officer in charge of me in my first station in Strathclyde Fire Brigade. His name was Jimmy Simpson. He was an Aberdonian. And uh, when I joined, straight away, people told me that he wasn't a good boss. He, he made you work too hard. He always had you out doing, in the fire service, you would do drills, running hose up and down ladders, um, pretending that you're you know, simulating a rescues uh, down ladders and I believed that when people told me that that somehow that was a bad thing but let me tell you it took me about 10 or 12 years to recognize that what that man did is that man ensured that we always knew the basics that we knew the basics inside and out and you'll find sometimes in business that you meet people who surprise you because they don't understand the basics even if they understand some of the more complex parts of the business. So first and foremost, my learning 10 or 12 years later is you have to understand the basics. And in my career in aviation, I've effectively worked in every department in this business and I understand the roles of everybody in the business. What I would say, however, is you also have to value the input that people, that people have, whether it be in your study, or whether it be in business. And for me, certainly, um, I fully understand the role of a security officer as an example. I run the airports. We have thousands or more security officers, but I could never be a security officer. I just don't have the capability that my security officers have to do the role that they have. As an example, if you're a security officer in an airport, as you go through security, you'll recognise that some people are 
uh, taking your bags and things from you and helping you pack. That has to be packed in a very particular way for the person who's scanning. When you, your bag is through the X-ray machine, the scanner, the X-ray operator, has five seconds to decide whether there's a threat inside that bag. And they have to get it right at least 99% of the time. If they don't, they get retrained. If they be retrained a number of times, then they're no longer capable of working at the airport. That's how stressful and complex and capable these guys are. And I've tried a couple of times to do the role that they do, and I can't do it. So therefore, value the people who are around you, because it's that team that brings together the success of the organisation. Uh, another person that I worked with many years ago uh, was a gentleman called Ian Morrison, and Ian was authentic and honest. I worked in many jobs, I sold cars for a time, I sold kitchens, I sold double glazing, and sometimes integrity in some of these organisations weren't what you'd expect them to be. And I remember working with Ian for a period where we had made a mistake, we used to sell uh, glazed windows, and we'd made the mistake when, when fitting it, and it created a crack along the bottom. Now, we could easily have said that it was fine when we put it in and somebody must have cracked it after we left, because it was a vacant uh, premises. And I remember going back and speaking to him, and the first thing he did was pick up the phone to the customer, explained that we had made a mistake, and at great expense to us, replaced it. So he was authentic. That's what he would have done in his normal working, his normal uh, family life, and he did the same thing in his business life. And authenticity is absolutely key when you go through your career. There'll be many challenges in where your values are tested or your thoughts and processes are tested and people are expecting you to do things that you, you, know, you just might not want uh, to do because it goes against how you see life. But sometimes people can fold to that pressure to ensure that they get the benefits that they get from their career. But it always comes back to you, so authenticity is absolutely key as you move forward in your, your career. And if you take nothing else away today, always be true to yourself when you're sitting in any situation, whether it be through your study, through your personal life, or through your work life. And I think lastly is maybe just to say that um, this for me would be the most important thing that you could ever learn when it comes to life or career. And that is that there is no shortcut to success, but hard work. There is no winning of the lottery when it comes to your career. Nobody will come and give you your dream job just because you wanted it. It will come through hard work and effort. And everybody that you see that's successful today will have a story that's got decades of hard work sitting behind it. And if you can get your head around that really early in your career, and you can set yourself up for that, if you recognise that you, know, you don't just train hard for the qualifiers, you have to stay there for the whole competition. If you think of it as your career is a marathon and not a sprint, then there is no shortcut to success but hard work. And you've already experienced some of that. You've already went through your degrees, you're probably doing them just now, probably still trying to work out what you call your dissertation. Um, you have that experience, understand that that level that you're operating at just now is a level that you need to operate for the rest of your career if you want to be successful. And I have no doubt that coming from GCU and doing the work that you're doing just now with the staff that's operating at GCU, that everybody in this uh, call will be successful moving forward. So I think I'll probably stop there. I know there's some questions um, that we can open up to. I'll maybe just pass back to John. Thanks very much, uh, Derek. <clears throat> um, I think there's um, there's an awful lot there for our students and, and staff to take back. And it's a, fashion, uh, a fascinating tour you gave us. Um, I want to carry on with those personal issues, first of all, because the airline business and airports still maintains a lot of appeal for many of our students. And we've got three of them, Khaled, John and Richard, from different backgrounds, one with a degree in risk, 
like yourself, one in supply chain management and uh, another one in telecom who are interested in careers in aviation. Any steer you can give those students and indeed any of our students who seem to find the enduring appeal of uh, airlines, even at this tough time, still to be a pull factor. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think this is a fantastic time to to join aviation. I think that there will be some changes in aviation operates moving forward. We will always have the low cost dominance, but I think that we'll see less of that moving forward and there'll be a change to higher levels of customer expectation and experience. I don't think we're going to see so much of the low cost customer experience element purely because of the climate change challenge that's taking place. And therefore, we do think that we'll see a reduction in the amount of flights individuals take over, uh, over an annual period. And during this pandemic, because aviation has been so hard hit, we've lost so many people. At, at our airports, uh, I have roughly about 10,000 people uh, directly and indirectly employed. We've lost about two and a half thousand over Aberdeen and Glasgow alone. And what will happen, particularly from this year moving forward, is we'll start to see quite a hockey stick ramp up again as aviation starts to open back up and people coming back into the business. Even just today, I spoke about two people that we had to let go over a year ago, we've now just uh, re-retreated again. Um, so there is a real drive now. A Manchester Airport Group, who own uh, four airports, have 1,000 vacancies at this moment in time. So there are real opportunities for people to come in to aviation. As a tip, firstly, you should go into any of the airport sites because we all have vacancy portals that will tell you what roles are available. But what I would also do is I would contact the recruitment managers or the HR managers for those airports. Speak to them and send them your CV afterwards to get your name forward, but more importantly, explain to them not just from a CV, but from a covering letter or a conversation why you're so keen on aviation, because we're really keen to bring people back in to the industry. And what I will do actually at the end of the uh, discussion today is I'll send out a, a, a website address that the UK government have just created which is an aviation skills retention portal, which allows people to A, look at the vacancies that are available and also put forward CVs in areas of interest. And what that does is that brings all the airlines and all airports in the UK into a single portal, because I'm conscious there'll be many people on the call that won't be Glasgow or Scotland based. So we can share that after it, John, and uh, give people that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, pass that across and we'll circulate it. Um, uh, that, that's a great opportunity. I suppose then, um, what I'm seeing then is that people from a variety of discipline areas can find a home in the airline industry, the aviation industry. Um, there's this space there, you know, a thousand vacancies in Manchester. There must be a lot of skill sets and qualifications in demand in that kind of location. You have engineering, telecommunications, law, accountancy, finance, uh, risk, assurance, they are just, it's endless. I, if you look at an airport, just think of an airport as being a small city. Everything you need to run a city is what you need to run an airport. Okay, that's helpful. Um, just in terms of, you've talked a lot about your career um, and you've done almost 30 different jobs, which is amazing. And you've stressed the importance of, of flexibility and change. I suppose, thinking back to the very beginning of your career, the one piece of advice you wish somebody had given you, and that's a question from Patricia Wu, one of our students. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and actually, it took me some time to, to ground myself on, on an answer to this. But I think throughout my career, there have always been, and I mean from the time I was at school, um, there has always been 
a limitation set. So people can set limitations on what you can achieve. And that limitation is based on their perception of who you are based on what they see in that interaction. You know, I uh, I would never have thought when I left school that I had the, the intelligence to, to get a degree. And in different roles, people can sometimes tend to pigeonhole you and think that that's the role that's right for you. An example would be even times when I was an operations director uh, running airports, uh, there was thoughts that maybe you can't, you don't, you're not commercially minded and therefore moving into general management, something that you might not be able to do. So for me, the lesson that I've learned and never let anybody uh, limit your desire or your expectation to succeed. The difference between success and failure is time and work. And as long as you put that time in, you can succeed anyway. Okay. Changing tack a little bit, there's a kind of cluster of questions around about sustainability and that uh, old chestnut of uh, aviation and sustainability. Um, I think um, early on we got Kevin uh, Coutinho who was asking about what are the sustainable fuel solutions for the industry in the future. And Carlo in the question and answers asking about what do you actually mean when you talk about sustainability and aviation? I think he's hinting that they might be contradictory there. Um, and, you know, we are some way from sustainable fuels and electric airlines. Um, so I suppose it's, it's that sort of stuff because we've got a generation who are very interested now in the impact of business on the planet, on the environment. Uh, and you guys, of course, notoriously have been a punch bag for, for, for many, many people. And I know you spoke at COP26 on just this issue. So can we kick that around a little bit? That, that of sort of, yeah? Yeah, of course. Um, so first and foremost, the, the lifeline of aviation will be its response to climate change. If aviation doesn't meet its requirements, then aviation will be a dying industry. And of course, there's a conflict in there. It's almost impossible to foresee a world that gets smaller and has less connectivity. So therefore, as an industry, we have to meet those challenges as we move forward. And there's two things when we speak about aviation, people kind of automatically go to the aircraft in the sky. But if I speak from my business, first and foremost, we are um, we're a, small, we're a small town, a small city, we're a massive infrastructure uh, company. We own lots of buildings and utilities and we generate lots of power. We've got lots of systems in place. And so first and foremost for us, we have to look and say, how do we reduce the carbon footprint that we have as a business? And so we look at a... Uh, the, the kind of three levels for us, which is scopes one, two, and three. Scopes one and two moving towards net zero is the carbon that we produce as a, an organization, as an airport. That's predominantly the utilities that we have and we operate in our infrastructure. And then we look at three, which is our business partners. So that's your airlines, your handling agents, everything that turns that aircraft around. And from an AGS perspective, in 2020, all three of our airports became carbon neutral. Most of that through offsetting. There's also a group called a uh, Gresby, and that's the kind of global register for assets and structures. And it's a benchmark of how organizations of different sizes and different industries should manage their carbon footprint. As I say, it's global and we are part of that. Um, and what it does is it balances us, it benchmarks our performance against best performance, and it gives you a result to tell you whether you're moving in the right direction. Uh, at AGS, you know, we were delighted. Uh, last year, we were first, second, and third in the UK for uh, infrastructure organizations meeting carbon footprint requirements. 
We were second, fifth and seventh in Europe, and we were third, fifth and ninth globally. So we really recognise the, the importance of what we do. But of course, we need to get to net zero. And in the UK, the UK was the first uh, nation uh, to have an aviation strategy that reached net zero by 2050. Because the predominance of our business is in Scotland, then our challenge to do is to do that aligned with the Scottish Government in 2045. So to give you an example of some of the things that we do from an environmental perspective, but then I want to speak about economic and social, which is another part of uh, climate change. Um, we, we will be uh, shortly announcing a solar farm that will effectively generate power for all of the airport. So we'll generate our own power. Just now, all of our power is 100% renewable. We're also working with a, a startup called Catholic Technologies on wind power. And these are like one meter tube wind turbines that can be modularized, but they can go along the side of the runways, they can go on roofs, and they can start to generate. And then we start to look at things like our fleets. We are the first uh, business in the UK to have a fleet of electric uh, buses operating at our airports. And all of our vehicles move into electric fleet or hybrid and have been now for the last couple of years. So these are the things that we can do within our own structure. When we start to work with the wider aviation industry, with the airlines, and one of the questions was around uh, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel. Now, sustainable aviation fuel is fuel that's, that's generated and made, manufactured from household waste, plastics, uh, agricultural waste, woodland waste, farmland waste. And uh, there has been a survey done on those plants in the UK that are able to create uh, sustainable av aviation fuel. And we're really fortunate because uh, in Scotland, we've got St Fergus up in the north and we've got Grangemouth. And Grangemouth is the only refinery that can create sustainable aviation fuel from all eight uh, food sources. The challenge that we have now is to get sustainable aviation fuel uh, produced to a scale that brings the price of it down to a point that the airlines are able to operate. Today, sustainable aviation fuel, just think of it, same as organic vegetables, <clears throat> is four times non-sustainable fuel. And so what we are doing now is we are working with the Scottish Investment Bank through the Scottish Government to see where we can start to prompt funding for sustainable aviation fuel to bring investors in to start to scale up sustainable aviation fuel to bring the price down and allow their lines to start to use it. And last November we, uh, but it's here today, uh, last November we held a, a, an event with Boeing who flew a 737 from Alaska across the Glasgow Airport on sustainable aviation fuel. Many airlines like EasyJet use sustainable aviation fuel today. Normally it's a 25 to 50 percent mix. We just don't have enough of it. So it's only about production. The beauty of sustainable aviation fuel is we don't have to change the technology in the aircraft or the technology in the fuel browsers. We can put it straight in because it has to meet the same calorific value. It's just about scaling that up. The other point I would raise, John, is on electric flight. We have a transition period that's no different than the carbonaceous fuels and oil and gas industry. We have to transition from where we are today to where we need to get to. And so to do that, we need to have a proper detailed plan in there. And it's not about, it's not only about sustainable aviation fuel. <clears throat> it will take time for that investment to come in to allow us to scale up. But we do have electric aircraft and Logan Air, which is a Scottish-based airline, will be flying the first commercial uh, electric flight in 2023, which will operate between the mainland and the islands of Scotland. And so there's a thing here that says it's, that there's not a silver bullet where one day you fly with fuel, next day you fly either electric or with the uh, sustainable aviation. 
There's different the regional airports that we serve in Glasgow, Aberdeen, and Southampton. Southampton serves the Channel Islands. They're perfect for electric flight. So we would probably see about 20 to 25 percent of the flights operating out of our airports being able to operate as early as 2024. And that includes um, two companies that we have MOUs with that memorandums of understanding with today that we expect to start to see flight taking place as early as 2024. And these are eVTOL flights, so electric, vertical landing and takeoff flights. And again, the they do shorter distances, 150 to 200 miles, but you don't need a large aircraft to do that. These are small aircraft that are maybe 8 to 20 seat aircraft. These things will be coming into place within the next three to four years. And then the last thing is for us is how do we use our knowledge and experience to help the country and to help the regions? And one of the things that we do, and I spoke about at COP, we are leading a program called Kalis. And Kalis is the world's first uh, beyond visual line of sight drone network. So you've heard people speaking about the Amazon drones that are going to come and uh, deliver your parcels. Well, that's a vision, but it's not in place at this moment in time. Next year, we've been trialing this now for the last year and a half. If you need vital, and it, it's aligned with the Scottish NHS, if you need vital medical treatment, whether you've got a cancer and you need a blood transfusion or you need delivery of vital medical care and you live in remote rural areas of Scotland, it can take hours for that to get to you. And an example would be if you need a blood transfusion with cancer, the aerated blood has to get into your body within two hours. If you leave that aerated blood, travel it by road, then by sea to get to an island, in Scotland, the chances are <clears throat> the blood may not be good by the time it gets to you, and you've got a lot of CO2 emissions being emitted during that time. Next year, we'll try on drone delivery, where the drone will leave one of our airports and go directly to the place that it's required, whether it be the hospital, the clinic, the, or the, the patient itself. And what that does is that revolutionises the way a uh, drone delivery and uh, medical supplies are shared, not just in Scotland, that will become global very, very quickly. And what we'll do is we'll manage air traffic control, we'll manage the servicing and engineering of those aircraft, and we'll manage the reprogramming of them into the network. So these are the areas that, as a business, we can help climate change moving forward beyond just changing aircraft. Okay, I mean, un undoubtedly, you know, there is a big universe to consider from the infrastructure, the 200 plus companies around you that support passengers getting on board flights, and, you know, obviously the aviation itself. But I think there's a lot of, a lot of signs of hope there. Um, and I suppose that brings me to the next question, which is to do with one or two of the students asked about business resilience, um, Milena, but I mean, from my own perspective, it's about how do you recover from this global pandemic in your sector? You've already talked about, um, you know, the last normal year, the 2019 and the volumes that you would have enjoyed, uh, the 15 million passengers plus, and now the loss of two and a half thousand jobs. What's the kind of time scale for recovery? And, and how do you think that recovery is going to be characterized? You've already hinted, I think, that the frequency uh, and the number of airlines might be less than we saw before. But give, give the audience some idea of the scale of impact um, that the, the pandemic has had since March 2020 on, on your business at AGS. Yeah, firstly to say, to create a route network out of an airport for a city takes years, sometimes decades, to create that. To lose it can happen uh, really quickly. And this, this pandemic has, you know, we've seen nothing like it before uh, in the industry and we were never prepared for something 
uh, as cataclysmic uh, as we've experienced. So to put that into some kind of perspective, um, since the pandemic started, 44 million seats have been lost in the marketplace. And those are seats that have, have been lost due to the collapse of 23 airlines. And those 23 airlines were operating fleets of aircraft up to 150 to maybe 200 uh, aircraft. And when, when they collapsed, the aircraft have come out of the system and the airlines have went and you don't have the staff to fly those aircraft any longer. And then actually across Europe, most airports are state-owned. So the same number of airports exist going forward. Only in the UK are we so um, privately owned as businesses. And so the challenge that we have moving forward is we have the same number of airports but far less aircraft to service the market. <clears throat> and this is where the challenge is going to come. This is why it's going to take a period of time to build back because during the pandemic, Boeing stopped making aircraft and Rolls Royce stopped making engines. And so when the order book starts up again, there's about an 18 month delay before you get back to the 2019 starting point and then the ramp up that's required thereafter. So we think that we will see passenger volumes returning to pre-pandemic levels around about 2025 or 2026. But because the competition is going to be so great for those aircraft, then our commercial conditions are going to be different. And therefore, we think that our revenues and our profit levels for that same number of passenger in 2019 is likely to be the end of the decade. Now, what that means is there's real challenges for infrastructure uh, renewal. So, you know, it costs... An AGS that maybe costs us 10 or 12 million pounds a year just to stand still, which is about renewing the infrastructure that you've already got because you have it through wear and tear. And if you're not generating that through your profits, then we need to find different ways in which we operate the business and or innovation becomes key. And I think moving forward, all uh, industries that have been hard hit by this pandemic, we're going to see a massive rise in innovation and new ways of looking at business and new ways of looking at uh, customer experience and how we can monetize that customer experience. And that's really what we're doing just now. We're working on our innovation strategy. That's why we're looking at solar farms and wind farms. That's why we're looking at drone projects. But, you know, pre-pandemic, airline airports and drones just don't go on. We're not good bedfellows. Now we see ourselves as business partners. That. So the, it's that innovation that's going to be required now to turn us around from the losses that the losses that we've made, we've made, you never get them back. If somebody doesn't fly on an aircraft, they're going to fly twice because they missed a flight. So their losses that we've had to support through a investment from our shareholders and banks, but now we have to find ways of getting back to levels of profitability to pay off that debt and get back to 2019 levels. So it's interesting hearing that because you tend to seem to be telling me that it's about innovation, it's about commercial responses, it's about looking at looking at the environment differently. You're not actually like many of your colleagues saying government should step in, government do more, government should resolve this. Where does Scottish government and indeed Westminster stand in this for you, Derek? Yeah, we don't need government um, money. We're not asking for government money to bail out uh, our business or our industry. But what government needs to do now is that competition that discussed around trying to bring airlines back to the airport. Remembering that people don't travel to airports, they travel to cities and they travel to regions. If we lose that connectivity, we lose that connectivity for business, we lose it for import and export, we lose it for inbound and outbound tourism. So now what we need is UK and uh, Scottish government to make the environment that we're operating in um, conducive to connectivity for the country. Because actually, if we don't get the connectivity, 
for every penny I earn, the country earns hundreds of pounds. Uh, so for us now, we're trying to explain to the government that we understand climate change. We understand our responsibilities and we will meet every target put in front of us. But to do that, we need to have a commercial business to operate. And that commercial business needs the support of government to promote the country, to allow us to generate that business moving forward. Because the inward investment we've got, the Morgan Stanleys, the HSBCs and SSEs that operate uh, within the city, they come because they've got global connectivity from uh, Glasgow or Aberdeen or London or wherever they tend to operate. And if they don't have that connectivity, they'll move to wherever that connectivity exists. And that may be, it's not Glasgow, it's Edinburgh, that may be, it's not Scotland, it's France or Italy or Germany. So what we're calling on the government now is recognise that we've lost connectivity and let's start promoting through destination management the country and the regions of uh, Scotland. Okay. And I suppose just to, to, to tail that one off then, those businesses, those SSEs, those HSBC, they've learned to work in different ways. And the demand for business aviation, business air travel, by anybody's standards, everyone is suggesting that is going to slump. That's not going to ever recover to what we saw before. And obviously for certain airlines, business Travel is the critical part of profitability, not for all of them, but for some. How do you compensate for that when that business market has learned to work and operate in a different way using the technology we're using at the moment? Yeah, I think it depends on the, the level by which you think that business travel is going to subside. So uh, in the research that we've that we look at from an aviation sector, we think that there's a likelihood that moving forward, post-pandemic, you'll have somewhere between 10 to 15% reduction in business travel. Um, it's not where we are today, where you've got 40 or 50 or 60% reduction in business travel. These method, these technologies that we use today, they're fantastic for the type of business that uh, you're having meetings. But if you've got serious business meetings worth millions or billions of pounds. Relationship is key. If you're buying a product from someone in China, you want to be in China to make sure that the product has actually uh, been made there. So there will be a reduction, as I said, we think it's 10 uh, to 15%. And I also, as I said before, I think based on climate change, society is going to travel less. And so therefore, I think the a low cost is always going to exist because people are going to want to travel at a lower cost. I think the, the dominance and the volume of that will change and you will see, and I think it's probably the case um, in many parts of uh, life, moving forward, the price will start to increase. People will travel maybe less, but more money will be, uh, will, will change hands, those transactions moving forward. And that's, but it will take time. And that's why I'm saying it's going to take us some time to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Hmm. Okay. Well, if I want to keep my job, I've got to hand back to the principal, uh, Derek. But I, I just want to say, I, I could probably keep asking you questions for another hour and a half myself, you know. But um, it's been really excellent. And uh, thank you very much for sharing that knowledge, but also those potential um, addresses and emails and contacts, etc., which we will circulate for those students who remain keen and fascinated by the aviation industry, which will always uh, exert that kind of interest. So I'm going to hand over to uh, our, our principal, Professor Pamela Gillis, um, to, uh, to do the thank you and the farewell. Thanks again, Derek. Appreciate that. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. Well, Derek, that was absolutely fantastic. Really interesting. And I, I loved all your life lessons. So I love the fact that you're committed to the transformational power of education and qualifications linked to on the ground experience and work. That tip you gave us about don't be frightened to take new opportunities and roles as they present themselves. Put yourself out there, have a go. 
your comments around what I took from from your comments were around rejecting the imposter syndrome. Be confident in your own development and career. Recognize the value you see in others. Uh, I, I thought that was lovely, the, the example you gave. And do understand the basics. You, you can't get away with not understanding the core business that you're engaged in. Be authentic, always be yourself. And I was thrilled to hear uh, that like Sir Alex Ferguson, you believe hard work is essential. Uh, and if there's a fair wind and a fading of the pandem pandemic, I am absolutely certain that you will be Dr. Proven uh, before ere long. So thank you so much again uh, for all the time you've given us today, the tips and that, that, that final point about the need for innovation. We need to think about new ways of doing things and it's going to take a long time for all of us to recover from this pandemic. But we've got the ingenuity and in aviation, we've got people like you uh, leading the way. Thank you so much, Derek.